everyone. I'm Lawson, one of your presenters. And hello, I'm Rishi. We're both freshmen in the Department of Education. <laughs> so before we get started, so today is our last lecture, so that means um, don't come by next week. No one will be here. Uh, we had some people do that in the past. Um, also, so a few, one more thing about the final paper. So the paper is due Friday at midnight, but for the extra credit deadline, that is tonight at midnight. And what that means is that will drop, drop your two lowest quizzes or bump them up. So we'll probably just bump them up. So or if attendance. or attendance, really, what, or whatever you need, we'll bump them up. So if you get them done, if you get your paper in by tonight at midnight, then that will work wonders for your grade. You can go home and write this paper in like an hour. Like just go home and do it tonight because you get extra credit. And if you choose something that is interesting and that you care about, it'll write itself. Um, so I think it's like 800 words. 800 to 1,000? Yeah. Okay, yeah. 800 to 1,000, like write it out, pick an interesting topic, talk to us after class if you still don't know what you wanna write about. Um, we can give you some inspiration, but try to get in by tonight because it's like easy two quizzes or two whatever, whatever you need points. Yeah, it's easy points and you don't have to do it again or you don't have to do it later on. So might as well get it done now and so you don't have to do it later. Or no, yeah, if not, be sure. Friday at midnight is the final deadline. So Thursday at 11.59. I mean Friday, Friday 11.59, <laughs> Friday night. So. Um, and then I updated everyone's attendance in B courses who submitted makeup attendance form. Uh, but if you don't see it reflected for some reason, because I noticed some people submitted forms for lectures that they actually already had points for. So I was, con so I think that there may have been a mistake with which lecture was chosen. So if you see you submitted a makeup attendance form but don't see that reflected in your grade, come see me after class and I will try to update that for you and see what went wrong. Um, and then, so for all of these, these last three lectures, um, there's extra credit involved with those just for coming to these. So we'll be updating those during the lecture today. So they'll be all set by the time you leave tonight. And then our final announcement is we have our last Berkeley blockchain e like meetup, which is tomorrow. And so if you're interested, there are more details online. You can just go to tinyurl.com slash BBM1221 for more information. And so register now, and you'll, if you go to that and send proof you went, uh, you will also get extra credit for that. Okay, and then with that. We're not teaching the decal next semester. We're studying abroad in Barcelona. So if you want to come visit us, come to Barcelona in spring break next semester. I have a job. Okay, take it away. Okay, without further ado, let's get going. Okay, so to start, this is just the table of contents. This is what we're going through today. Review of our scalability lecture that we've had so far, and then a deeper dive into plasma alongside rollups and then modern solutions. All right, so meet your lecturers. This is us. Yep, all right. <laughs> all right, first, first for our scalability review. All right, so the classic scalability problem as transactions go up, as blockchain gets more used, our, our problem is that block time goes up as well, or Block time goes down, and thus this is a big problem. The scalability triangle, as we've we've seen this before in our last lecture, so I'm going to go through this relatively quickly. But we have two options: whether that's either going to L2 or staying on L1 and changing the way we do consensus on these uh, on the blockchain. So solutions for staying on the the same chain L1 and doing it that way would be either from shifting shifting from proof of work to proof of stake, or yeah, al also sharding would be another option for that. You, okay, sure. So the, the, the issues with uh, layer one in and of itself is the fact that it requires more constant effort to maintain on the main chain. And because of that, gas fees are higher and this just takes a lot more work in general. As Vitalik Buterin says, it is a bad idea to build sophisticated features into the base of the layer of the blockchain. Yada, 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 you guys can read this as well. But essentially, this is just review, so yeah, we're just speeding through it. So essentially understanding the issues with working on layer one uh, with the solutions we have, it's primarily driven from the fact that it needs more centralization, which goes against the base of blockchain and kind of what everything the technology stands for. So what this does is it pushes us to think about layer two solutions or building further technologies on top of the main chain. And you can see the most common L2 solutions listed here are um, working on state channels, which are essentially enabling communication between participants of the chain, 
um, and participants of smart contracts on Ethereum, or working with nested blockchains, which refers to the concept of Plasma, which we'll get into later. So first, looking at the topic of state channels, um, like I said, uh, this is the ability to establish a communication channel between participants of the blockchain. And what this does is it removes the third party dependence on the miners. So communication and discussion of terms of things such as smart contracts can happen in the absence of the miners, reducing the computation power needed to um, communicate on the chain. And in order to ensure the security of transactions on this you know, sort of off chain uh, state channel, um, it's actually uh, added on to the smart contract to seal off this communication where the participants can interact directly with each other. And there are safeguards in place, um, like is mentioned on the slide, the Lightning Network on Bitcoin and the Raiden Network on Ethereum work in this way to offer these state channels and increase scalability for their functionality. And the biggest um, aspect of, for safeguarding these transactions and communication that's used are hashed time lock contracts or HTLCs. So getting into what exactly those are and how they work, um, essentially in layman's term, it allows the recipients of transactions to acknowledge that they have received payments um, and in order to do so, they're required to submit a cryptographic proof within a specific time frame that's set in the terms of the contract. And what this allows is obviously intuitively uh, preventing duplicate spending of coins and ensuring that the sender and recipient of different contracts and transactions both agree to the terms and that therefore no fraud is occurring. Like is mentioned on the slide, this inherently does reduce the counterparty risk because we are moving some of the functionality off the chain. There needs to, the safeguard continues to extend onto the functionality that uh, state channels provide. And therefore, by establishing the time feature of the HTLCs, it ensures that the acknowledgement from both parties must occur in that period of time, or else the transaction is forfeited and the coins and uh, transaction materials are returned to the sender or the initial sender in the contract. So the actual technical underlying of this relies on the hashing of pre-images that's revealed after the final transaction occurs to ensure that both the recipient and the sender have agreed to the transaction. And once they're hashed together, the transaction becomes finalized and the materials are distributed. So like I said, um, the pro uh, it's programmed on that termination date and that's what ensures the security of these contracts. A simple example, like we've seen in the past with Alice and Bob, um, if Alice wanted to exchange her Bitcoin or a portion of her Bitcoin for Litecoin from Bob, um, the first step that takes place is both Alice and Bob hashing their um, pre-images uh, on their own individual chains. So for Alice, this would happen on a Litecoin chain. For Bob, this would happen on a Bitcoin chain. And once these pre-image hashes are made, they would exchange these um, alongside the transaction that they send. And once uh, Alice receives Bob's transaction, Bob receives Alice's transaction, these pre-images are used to verify that the both materials were received from both sides of the party and the HTLC is then satisfied, the time lock is released and the verification occurs, therefore releasing the materials that were transacted. The next step um, after state channels, uh, which was our first layer two solution, is the concept of nested blockchains. And this, the biggest use case we'll look in this situation is the topic of plasma which is being developed by Omis Go. Um, it's been existent for a couple of years. It was uh, kind of a larger topic of interest a couple of years ago. However, we think it's very useful to learn about it because Plasma is providing the foundation for many other layer two solutions that can be built on, upon this concept of nested blockchains. And the biggest um, benefit we see from applying nested blockchains is simply the fact that we're able to offload uh, computational power from the main chain. And like we saw in the first diagram, um, when you offload the computational power from the blockchain, you then don't have to choose between the trade-off of increasing block size uh, and decreasing the block time. So by delegating the uh, computational power to what we know as child chains from the parent chain like uh, Bitcoin or Ethereum, this reduces the load of transactions that need to occur on the main chain itself and inherently makes the main chain more scalable. So that was pretty hefty. Do any of you guys have any questions about the general concept of state channels or nested blockchains? Okay, cool. So now we just like to dive a little bit deeper into the topic of Plasma, like I mentioned, um, one of the headline uh, use cases of nested blockchains. So to start with uh, just the basics of what Plasma is, um, we start looking um, at the concept of Ethereum, understanding how that has progressed the scalability of blockchain uh, overall because it has boosted the scalability with the increase in use cases available uh, with the smart contract uh, capabilities. 
Um, however, like we saw uh, from the quote of Ethereum's founder, um, there still demands a lot of on-chain infrastructure uh, alterations in order to boost the scalability, and this requires a lot of resources to be inputted into the functionality, and again, feeds back into that scalability issue. What Plasma does is it omits all this unnecessary data from the root chain or the main chain and disperses it into the, chi uh, the infinite number of child chains, as we'll get into a little bit later. And this handles all of the smart contract capabilities and returns the completed transactions to the main blockchain. So the inherent security of blockchain technology is still preserved since the final transactions are being pushed back onto the main chain. However, all of the processing and communication through things such as state channels occurs in these child chains and therefore doesn't burden the scalability capabilities of the main chain. Um, just going over how it works again, as you can see in the little diagram on the right side, we see kind of how similar to what we saw in sharding um, in previous lectures, uh, the root chain is able to nest an infinite amount of uh, child chains that can each uh, gather and handle different levels of smart contract capabilities, ensuring that the transactions go through and verifying that the transactions take place, and then finally reporting the results and the completed transactions back uh, to the root chain, which in this diagram is Ethereum. So like is mentioned on the slide, the architecture allows there to be an infinite number of child chains, which makes Plasma and the concept that Plasma is built on top of very powerful since we're able to essentially uh, shard the capabilities and requirements of the transactions that need to take place into an infinite amount of individual chains. Um, feeding back into that scalability triangle where we reduce the amount of computational power that's needed and therefore increase the uh, speed and efficiency of the transactions themselves. Thinking about an important concept of blockchain again, we always come back to the topic of security, um, understanding how even with these child chains and branching off the information into different subchains, how we can ensure that the data and transactions are secure. And the uh, feature that allows this is known as proof of fraud, which ensures a channel of exchangeability between the layer one, the main chain, or the layer two solutions, which are the child chains of Plasma. Each individual child chain itself has its own validation mechanisms um, with its own fraud proofs. And what this allows is that users who are currently working on child chains can report directly to the main chain to identify rogue nodes and protect their funds. So this allows a very efficient way for uh, fraud to be reported and for users and uh, participants of contracts to back out and preserve their uh, resources and coins without um, having to go through the entire chain back up through the children to the parent. They have a direct relationship and channel of communication to the main chain itself. And just a little bit more technically into the fraud detection, um, when a party is trying to exit after a transaction occurs, um, there's a wait time to ensure that the verification can occur from both parties. And both parties must confirm the outputs um, based on the UTXO model that requests the withdrawal. So what this means is that each participant in a smart contract needs to submit proofs to be confirmed of whether or not the funds were received. And there's also a sub check to see if the funds were already spent. And what this allows is for the chain to deter and prevent any duplicate spending, which would obviously be a big issue in the case of transactions. So because this proof is required and there is a, a wait time incorporated into the child chains themselves, it allows the withdrawals to be verified, uh, communicated back to the main chain, and essentially ensures that all of the child chains are uh, carrying the same level of security and verification as the root chain itself. Um, it's always important to understand the drawbacks of the technology that we implement. Um, none of these solutions come with you know, perfect capabilities and efficiency. In the case of Plasma, there are many different variants of Plasma. As you can see on the slide, there are different strains such as Plasma MVP, which is vulnerable to a lot of network congestion, similar to um, a lot of L1 solutions that we see. And there's also Plasma Cash, which relates to NFT trading. And um, this requires obviously a very heavy dependence on the history of NFTs to understand uh, who traded these NFTs and where they're going to. So there are some drawbacks to Plasma that you know, prevent us to reaching the ideal level of scalability that we want to make blockchain uh, kind of an everyday thing and uh, integrate it into a lot of our other financial models. And if any of you are interested in the different strains of Plasma that I mentioned, um, there's some information on the screen right now. You can find these online by looking up you know, the titles of Plasma MVP or Cash or Debit. They're essentially different applications of the Plasma chain and network and the different situations and use cases that they're uh, applied in. 
and building off of that kind of the data structures they use, the efficiency that comes with them, and how feasible they are to be applied in different situations if you are ever developing or you know, building functionality on the blockchain. So just to conclude, um, Plasma is something that is becoming a little bit more obsolete in the present day. Like I mentioned, it was a lot bigger and a lot more, uh, get garnered a lot more attention uh, a couple of years ago. However, it's very important that we understand the precedence that it brought because a lot of future L2 solutions build on this concept of you know, sharding the information from the main chain onto subchains and executing them independently of the main chain's computational power and then reporting the final transactions back onto the main chain. So any questions about Plasma? Okay. <coughs> All right, next up we are talking about rollups, which is another L2 solution. <coughs> so first of all, what is a rollup? That's it. Any questions? <laughs> okay, anyway, so what is a rollup? It's a layer two solution where essentially we can perform transactions outside of layer one and then from there subsequently post these tran this transaction data onto L1 in a way that we can group transactions together and thus lower gas fees for individual persons. So by posting a transaction onto layer one, this is essentially, the transaction data is still secured on the main chain. However, in, in fact, we can do this without having to simply post our transaction in and of itself and thus pay higher gas fees. Essentially, this is the, the process in which how th this would perform. But so in, in doing that, there are different types of rollups that can occur and that we can use in order to have a successful rollup, one being optimistic and one being ZK. The difference being that they take different s paths in securing transaction data and posting different types of data to the actual main chain. So as, as you can see in the uh, steps, the optimistic rollups would secure on off-chain transactions and verify their validity through sequencers and in turn post an optimistic solution for, uh, or optimistic set of transactions to the blockchain, whereas ZK rollups would take a different approach in compiling a cryptographic proof and then proceed to post this on L1. And so we'll go into more detail on these right now. So firstly, we'll address optimistic rollups. So, to begin, optimistic rollups are created as smart contracts on Ethereum, which has the data of off-chain block, uh, of an off essentially an off-chain blockchain, where what a, a rollup would be doing and an update to the rollup would be this process right here, which is essentially a user would send a deploy transaction and with this, they would send that to an aggregator, where this aggregator would, in turn, deploy this transaction alongside other ones in a new smart contract, where essentially they would include, as noted above, the, the new state route, and uh, they would create this transaction on the Ethereum chain, which, can tra which contains the st state route calculated as well. So the, the reason and then the name of Optimistic comes from the fact that in, in creating this rollup, they post the transaction data to the main chain. However, they don't actually vet it in any way, or it, they, they don't do a hard vet of the, of the data. And so essentially there's two ways this can go. We either compile a bunch of transactions which are good and truthful and, and not malicious in any way, and that is the good path noted above here, which would be essentially that it, they just post to the chain and there's no extra computation or dispute period that need is needed to occur to actually secure the valid transactions. But then in the other case, which is would take a lot more work and a lot more time, essentially some node would have posted a invalid transaction and from that someone would notice and flag that transaction as something that's invalid and that shouldn't be compiled into the rollup onto the main chain. And so with this, that would lead to a dispute period where these tr this tra these all the transactions in the rollup are then vetted and we see which ones are actually valid and which ones are not. And then from there, valid ones or invalid ones are thus taken out and we get the proper rollup. But this requires a lot more computation as a fraud proof needs to be run. And also it takes a lot more time because you have a dispute period in which people have to have time to actually check and see if the, the valid transactions are included and the invalid ones are not. Oh, and so the good path is obviously good and the bad path is not as good. So we're not as happy about that. So just going further into the bad path in and of itself, the, the, the bad path is what 
inherently makes the optimistic worlds have dispute periods without a dispute period simply a, uh, a, a roll up including an invalid transaction could be instantly posted to the chain and with no dispute period the L1 would make that instantly immutable and you can't change your what, what had just previ previously happened. So in that you need to have a dispute period where nodes can see these transactions and notice if there are any invalid ones in them and from there it would be, it would be noted and you, you go through the whole process of like finding the invalid transactions and weeding them out. So this makes optimistic rollups inherently slower than the other rollups which we will be talking about which is ZK rollups. Um, but yeah, this is just one drawback. So <coughs> yes. And then secondly, we'll go on to ZK rollups. So ZK rollups are, they get their name ZK from the idea of a zero knowledge proof. So essentially what a zero knowledge proof is, is a way for one party to prove uh, that they have some sort of information to another party without actually disclosing that information to the party. So that it, it's, that's the entire concept, concept of a zero knowledge proof. So as like a more contextual example to see how that this would work, this is like a classic one. Um, essentially, in the girl in this case enters the cave and they, they both know that there's this secret door at the back of the cave. And so the girl goes to the back of the cave one way or the other. And then this, the, the guy enters the cave and tells her to come out one way or the other. So the girl can only come out the way the guy described if she has the secret key to the door and thus can pick which way she goes. And if she doesn't, then she'll always be trapped on one side of the, uh, on uh, one side of the cave and not the other. So in this way, because she can continuously come out the proper path, she can prove to the guy that she actually has the key to the door and isn't just continuously guessing the correct side to be on from the start. So this is, this is the, just the un, a contextualization of the idea of a zero knowledge proof. It's that you can prove information without actually disclosing that information to the, the verifier. So then a, a ZK snark is the, the next step of that. This is the how this idea of a zero knowledge proof is created in, in code and in blockchain. So it's this process of first a validity function is created using basic equations. From there that's taken into a rank one constraint system where these equations are essentially then translated into a large like complex polynomial. And these pol polynomials essentially, they're created in the sense that if a polynomial fails at one point in it, it fails at all points, like for example, like the solutions to a polynomial. So in this, you can kind of have this massively large complex polynomial that can kind of verify the truth of a statement or not, or the truth of transactions. And you can only need to check in certain spots, which can be completely randomized to actually verify that the entirety of the polynomial is correct without actually seeing the entire polynomial. So it's kind of in that way, you can only look at a small bit of the information to verify the entirety of the information. And from there, it's this idea of a zero knowledge evaluation where the verifier doesn't have to see all the information. But this is just the, the higher level analysis of what a ZK snark is and being created. So then in the rollup process, the Z these ZK rollups use ZK snarks. And so in that there are two parties um, in a ZK rollup. There are transactors, which are those who actually transact and create their transfers and broad broadcast this to the transfer network. And then there are relayers which essentially gather in a large amount of transactions and from that they create a rollup. So the relayer's jobs are to generate snark proofs which are essentially a, a ZK snark and this represents the, the change in the blockchain from before their snark proof is created to now after. And from that it's essentially like a snapshot of what has changed and uh, it, rep it reports only the changes in, in a verifiable hash to the mainnet. So now we can compare the differences between the two and what gives pros to one and cons to the other and whatnot. So for optimistic rollups, their 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 pros are simply the fact that they're as you guys like know the term Turing complete. They are Turing complete and EVM compatible. And obviously, a rollup in and of itself increases scalability compared to the mainnet because that's ex exactly what they're designed to do. Um, so they increase scalability. And also all of their data is available on chain. That's the one key difference, or not the one, but a key difference between ZK rollups and optimistic rollups is that ZK rollups only post their cryptographic hash to the main net. And, and simply with that, if, you, if that hash works, 
you know that all the subsequent data that is contained within that hash is correct. Whereas optimistic worlds take a different approach and post all the transaction data, and from there, it, it, it can be verified through other people. But in that, you c often will have to pay higher gas fees because you're inc including a lot more data onto the actual post of the roll up. Um, as for cons, uh, they have they're more limited in certain ways compared to plasma and zk rollups. Uh, to work, they have to basically trust that there's an honest majority of validators and that there's aggregators working at certain times. Essentially, it's just the, the concept of the fact that uh, they have to have the centralized trust. Um, and yeah, these ones are less so important. Mainly the other key takeaway is the fact that there are long wait, time, er, long wait times uh, because of the fact that you have to have this dispute period for optimistic rollups where you wait to see if someone has actually noticed an invalid transaction in the dispute period. Um, as for ZK rollups, uh, their pros are that there are reduced fees per transfer because this is another point of rollups. Uh, and that it's often faster, or it is faster quite often than ZK or optimistic rollups in Plasma, primarily because there isn't this dispute period. It is simply a hash that gets posted directly to the mainnet. And from there, it is posted and it's it's done at that point, which is nice. Um, and yeah, it also doesn't require as much trust from multiple different like sets of parties because of the fact that there isn't an, uh, a need for you to trust that people will actually verify that there are, aren't invalid transactions like an optimistic rollup would have. Instead, it's simply just like a, is there or is there not the case with the uh, cryptographic proof that is created. Um, as for cons, there are there are some risks that are posed to ZK rollups in terms of quantum computing, because inherently ZK rollups can be cracked easier than the the actual like SHA-256 methods that are created on the main chain, and so because that is it has slightly less security than the main chain in and of itself, and so ZK rollups could be cracked before the entire chain is compromised and thus just poses security. Uh, threats in that way uh, as well. Yeah, the, the, there's also a problem with ZK rollups in the fact that there's a lot of work that needs to be done to create these cryptographic proofs. So this is another downside to ZK rollups. And then as for a comparison, these are a couple key comparisons between the two types of rollups and seeing which ones are better in certain ways, which ones are not. Uh, ZK rollups are cheaper because they don't have to post all that data of all the transactions, simply just the validity proof. Um, they also have, ZK rollups have a faster finality time because of the fact that they don't have this dispute period as I've mentioned multiple times. Um, and then as well, uh, often again another plus for optimistic rollups would be the fact that they don't have as much computational power needed to create this cryptographic uh, hash. Instead they put this onus on trust in the community or and trust in the other parties to verify whether or not the transactions are valid when they post a massive list of transactions to the main chain in optimistic rollups, whereas ZK rollups have to trust the fact that they have to do a lot of computation to create a hash. So it's like a trade-off of ZK rollups have much more intense computation uh, in, in creating their rollup, whereas optimistic rollups forego this, but they trust a community of people much more to notice uh, invalid transactions um, themselves. And then as for use cases, this is just a couple use cases of either uh, type of rollup, Arbit Swarm, Optimism, Boba, Fuel Network, Sarkeesi, and then for ZK rollups, we have ZK Sync as ZK rollups are more so being flushed out now and like it's, it's more of a new thing in terms of actual implementation. So ZK Sync has a really interesting uh, implementation of them that has been created, I believe in 2020 and it's been going well so far, so. Yeah, these are a couple of use cases and uh, any questions? Um, well, I, I, I think a good example of when to use an optimistic rollup over a ZK rollup would be in more lower level transactions because often the, the, the computation needed to create a ZK, ZK rollup is quite high, and thus it, it for, for quote unquote more like meaningless transactions that are like lower sum, 
uh, I guess it could be more important to, or I guess it could be less, it's less valuable to spend such an intense amount of computation on creating a world up of this, or of smaller transactions like that. Um, but yeah, that, that could be one compare and contrast version of when to use one versus the other. Essentially, they're two different modes of doing the same thing. So both of them are, are created to increase scalability, increase the ability for people to kind of transact at a faster rate. So they are not interchangeable, but I in a consumer's eyes, quite often interchangeable. Uh, in certain uh, cases, yeah. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Okay. Now we'll go on to Rishi with modern serialization. So just to touch upon like a few uh, ways or directions that you know the technology is moving to handle this concept of scalability. Um, there's just like two quick examples. This is very important because scalability is kind of the biggest, you know, roadblock for blockchain to be more integrated into, you know, everyday life and, you know, everyday functions. So to start with one of the more you know, base level modern solutions, we simply have Ethereum 2.0. When Ethereum was first made, like I mentioned, it obviously expanded blockchain's capability in general because of the smart contracts, expanding the use cases and enabling you know, more complex uh, usages and procedures to be put onto the chain. The main issue that the community saw was the halting problem. Um, we covered this in an earlier lecture um, in this class. And the solution to this was you know, implementing gas to prevent those infinite loops that could clog up, clog up the network by capping the computational power of individuals using the chain. Um, and looking more towards the future with Ethereum 2.0, the biggest uh, element or asset that it has is the shard chain concept where, like I mentioned with Plasma, with child chains reporting back to the main chain, shard chains essentially follow a similar structure, branching off the computational power into subchains where functions and procedures can run in parallel rather than a singular miner or a singular group of miners moving linearly. So that's something that boosts the scalability and can be uh, expanded on in the future, applying that into different projects and scenarios. And then another interesting solution and company that's working in this space is Algorand, um, which uses the pure proof of stake uh, consensus mechanism. And it's something where uh, uh, actors such as known as selected verifiers are chosen by the Byzantine agreement. And this is interesting because the computation that each individual involved in you know, the program or contract has to do is uh, always constant and it's always generating and verifying signatures. So because this cost is not dependent on the number of users of each block or the size of the block, it's something that obviously inherently scales uh, with the size and amount of computational power. And uh, what they found is that when you increase the computational power uh, utilized through Algorand, the performance of the system altogether uh, increases in with a direct relationship um, because of the, the constant uh, costs that each individual on the program has to incur. So this is something that's exciting because it claims to you know, solve that trilemma or at least draw uh, a better compromise between the three points of that triangle we showed at the beginning. And it's something that you know, if you're very interested in this space, you should keep an eye on into how it develops and how other future solutions build upon the concepts and information that they were able to uncover here. So that was our presentation uh, about scalability. Thank you so much for listening.